down there? Yeah, I'm okay if we're all right. But are you all right? Oh, I'm fine. You mind if I use your phone? Sure, if you can find it. Thanks a lot. Another disaster falls into the life of Robin Williams in the film of John Irving's novel, The World According to Garp, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. Across the offer me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And this is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. In addition to The World According to Garp, we'll also be reviewing a French slice of life named The Aviator's Wife and Woody Allen's new movie, A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy. But first, Gene starts with Young Doctors in Love. Young Doctors in Love would like to do to TV soap operas set in hospitals what the comedy airplane did to airborne disaster movies. In other words, parody them, make fun of them. This sort of movie is very easy to evaluate. It all comes down to how many times did you laugh because that's all this kind of wild, episodic movie is after. Big laughs. Unfortunately, I didn't have too many in Young Doctors in Love, which follows the exploits of a class of interns at a Los Angeles City hospital. Here's a fairly typical sample of the humor as one of the interns examines an apparently pregnant woman with the hospital's emergency room physician, Patrick McNee, standing by. All right, young lady, you have a beautiful baby in no time. I don't think so, Doctor. What? What do you know you like? Hysterical pregnancy. She wants the straight life so badly that she's convinced herself she's pregnant. Doctor, this girl is in heavy labor. It's just not so, Doctor. Get out! Thank you, Doctor. What happened? Was that a balloon? Next. Poor kid. I never knew it was possible for a medical doctor to be so unfeeling. Sounds to me like you're falling in love with him. I don't know what was funny about that. It didn't strike me as funny. And uh, I'll go a little farther than that. I'm not sure what the people who made that scene thought was so funny about it. The popping of the balloon? That funny to you? No. Not to me. Okay. Here's another <laughs> example with the chief of staff and the intern arguing about another patient. Tell you about this operation, kid. It's a maze. Do you understand? You've done the operation before, yes, but no more. This one is not meant to be. Doctor Prang, I've appealed to you as a physician and as a man. There's only one other way to put this to you. Will you operate on Stephanie Brody? No. Look, no, but okay. We'll need a man anesthesiologist. We'll need an endocrine person. We'll get all the best people. We'll work with them until they can do it blindfolded. We'll have fun with this. Yeah. I really appreciate this, Dr. Prang. Okay, just don't hit me anymore. Who's that on the end? That's Dr. Quick, Doctor. Scalpel. No. Ready with the dialysis refractor? On. Counting now, Dr. Prang. Give it to me at fives. X-ray? Fifty. Blood count. Heart, normal. X-ray? 25. Time? 10 seconds. 5. No, nope, we're in trouble. 9 seconds. We're losing your... 8 seconds. I, I'm real clear. 7 seconds. Time is still blocked. Oxygen. Oxygen. Gin. 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 Counting down. Four. 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 There's a choice for you. Which is funnier, the stutterer or the mannequin? I like goofy movies as much as anyone, but I think Young Doctors in Love never got me to laugh out loud. For me, it was about a four-smile picture, which means that a lot of the jokes were simply not funny, at least to me. How about I you? I was really disappointed by this picture. I had seen Airplane and laughed all the way through right. it, and I also liked a TV series called uh, Police Squad that yeah. some of the same people right. were involved in. So I went to the film thinking, gee, this is a great subject that's going to have a lot of humorous possibilities. Mm -hmm. 
and I didn't laugh. I thought that many of the situations were, were telegraphed. I could see the jokes coming. Here it is. This is what they're going to do. Then they did it. The people in the film were very unlikable. The movie was rather cruel in terms of the way it made fun of some of the people rather than having fun with them as it did in airport. I don't even think it had an attitude. I just think it was like, you know, get me all the jokes you can get mm -hmm. that have anything to do with hospitals or anything. Mm -hmm. I think they got sort of desperate at the end and just uh, sort of a junk pile. Now on the hospital PA system when they said, E.T., call home, did you laugh? Phone home. Yes, that was funny. That was one of your smiles. That okay. was one of the smiles. Our next film is The Aviator's Wife, a movie about a 20-year-old man who's having a fairly unsuccessful love affair with a woman who's five years older. And earlier in the day the film begins, her previous lover visits her apartment to break up with her, but then the young man sees the previous lover leaving her apartment, so in this scene he cross-examines her jealously. Et comme je savais que tu n'aimais pas que je téléphone au bureau. Si tu me téléphonais que pour ce genre de choses, je te répondrais. C'est pas ça. Je voulais te prévenir. Enfin, ce matin à 8 heures. Donc, j'ai été chez toi, puis je vous ai vu sortir. Je t'expliquerai, mais pas ici dans la rue. Tu pourrais trouver un autre moment, non Et Tu comprends, ça m'a fait un choc. Ah, oh, mais je t'expliquerai Excuse-moi. Je... je croyais qu'il avait disparu. Payeur paru. François, fais-moi confiance, c'est vraiment pas grave. Si tu veux, sûr. On parlera de ça quand alors Je sais pas. Ce soir Ce soir, je suis prise. Demain Demain, je suis chez maman, je te l'ai déjà dit. Ça reste Lundi. On parlera de ça lundi soir. Mais lundi, je travaille. Bah, avant ton travail, on va pas parler de ça pendant des heures, non Je pense bien que je vais pas attendre lundi pour qu'on parle de ça. Tu n'avais qu'à pas espionner. Oh, écoute, c'est oh, un service, c'est comme ça que tu traites. Enfin, arrête, François. Fais-moi confiance, laisse-moi. Tu le vois, soir Il y a longtemps qu'il est à Paris. Tu me laisses ou je fais du scandale Dis-moi si tu le vois ce soir. Je t'ai dit mille fois que je voulais pas que tu, 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 tu m'ennuies, enfin. Je que ces affaires-là, ça me regarde moi aussi. Je confonds, François, si tu me fais confiance, si tu ne le fais pas, si tu ne le fais pas, bonsoir et adresse-toi ailleurs, j'en ai marre. Mais je t'ai fait confiance, tu m'avais dit que tu ne le reverrais plus. Pas du tout. J'avais dit qu'il avait disparu. Il était probable que je le reverrais plus. Puis il se trouve qu'il est revenu. Quand Je te dirais que ça me plaît, mais pas ici. Si tu avais un peu d'amitié pour moi, tu ne poserais pas ce genre de questions. Tu l'aimes Écoute, chute. Laisse-moi tranquille, François. Vraiment, c'est fini. Sans ça, je te vois plus si tu continues. J'en ai ras-le-bol. Ben, tu devrais te mettre à ma place aussi. Mais c'est toi qui devrais te mettre à la mienne, mon Dieu. Si tu avais un peu d'amitié pour moi, tu me poserais pas ce genre de questions. Bon, écoute. Si tu veux savoir, il part cet après-midi. T'es content maintenant, non Anne Au revoir. Et t'as bien une seconde Non, pas du tout. That's kind of an interesting scene, especially if you know that she knows more than she wants to tell him, and we know why she doesn't want to tell him. But in any event, he doesn't believe anything she says. <laughs> and later in the day, he sees the other man with another woman, so he decides to follow them and to provide himself with a cover. I hope, can you follow this? I am. He picks up a young girl on a bus for camouflage and brings her along, and she quickly enters into the spirit of the game. <laughs> Oh, attendez. Ils sont pas là Ils arrivent Ils arrivent euh, Faisons ce que vous parlez. Mais vous disiez quoi Euh. Ben. Ça fait une demi-heure qu'on parle et maintenant qu'il faut parler, mais il n'y a pas rien Je sais, je sais, mais. Si je vous disais que mon histoire est vraie à 100%. Non, 50. Ça ne veut rien inventer. Rien, je vous dis. Eh bien, moi, je dis si vous ne cessez de mentir. Parlez moins fort, ça fait pas naturel. Naturel oui. Mais c'est tout à fait naturel. Mais c'est vous qui n'êtes pas naturel. Vous avez pourquoi prendre ces arts de conspirateur C'est ça qui vous a marqué. Vous dites quoi Vous dites que là, non, c'est pas difficile. Bah non, rien pour moi n'est difficile. Puis de toute façon, la, le, le prof a dit que j'avais un très bon accent. Tiens. Euh, also, du hast dich verheiratet. Oh, il nous a regardé. Oh. Moi, je m'en vais. Mais non, laissez-les prendre un peu de champ. Oui, mais de toute façon, nous sommes grillés. Moi, mais pas je... du tout, pourquoi 
parlé du Zingaro. Bah, évidemment. Je criais en allemand. Qu'est-ce ah. que ça voulait dire Oh, also, du hast dich und verheiratet. Je sais pas verheiratet. Oh, de toute façon, il y a de fortes chances qu'ils connaissent pas oh, l'allemand. C'est un Alsacien. Euh, ben, on avait le droit de dire entre nous n'importe quoi. Ouais. Verheiratet. Hmm? Non, je vois vraiment pas. What's fun is that that apparently fairly simple situation is really part of a real complex situation. It's kind of fun to follow through the movie. We understand what's happening, and so everything that everybody says has an additional meaning. That game of cat and mouse there turns out to be based on a completely wrong premise because what the hero doesn't know is that his girlfriend is no longer interested in that other man that they were following, and she isn't much interested in him either. The whole movie is a kind of low-key romantic intrigue in which People get vaguely jealous while behaving with very moderate passion in situations that aren't really very dramatic. In The Aviator's Wife, not much happens, really, but a whole lot happens while not much is happening. The characters go through the motions of jealousy, but they're really more curious than anything else. This guy would actually rather follow that strange man just to see what he's up to than really be with his girlfriend. The movie's by a French director named Eric Romay, who specializes in close observations of how people relate to each other in ordinary social situations. This movie is something like his earlier films, like My Night at Maud's, Claire's Knee, and Chloe in the Afternoon. It's a patient, observant exercise in people watching. I think it's a terrific film because he always, in all the films that you mentioned, shows how people hide behind different little rubrics. Uh, sometimes it's, it's scholarship and phrase making. Here it's games of how a relationship is supposed to be handled, this young man thinks and it is so distant from, they have so many layers between them and direct action. And I think it's very wisely observed. I think the film is funny, but in a brittle sort of way. And then it ultimately, I think you feel very sad about these characters. Mm -hmm. The woman alone in her room, this young man who can't confront her. Uh, it's a very complex, fragile little picture, and I'm very glad I saw it. You know, one of the things that Romay does is he uh, has the patience to leave the camera and mm -hmm. let it set while we're watching people talk to each other. And they talk and talk, and it seems like a long conversation. Then we begin to realize all the intrigues that are going on. And you know, I think that my dinner with Andre, right. that the title of that film owes something to Romay's film, My Night at Maud's. Both right. films are about people who really share all kinds of philosophical insights and kind of hide behind them. There's a 20-minute uh, uh, conversation at a cafe in this picture mm -hmm. that is absolutely riveting. You wonder, you just sit there realizing, what are they talking about? The one little girl we saw just there, mm -hmm. the young girl, she knows what's going on. This other guy does not. Mm -hmm. Our next film tries to get into some of the same te territory, but not as successfully. It's Woody Allen's A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy, a light little picture set in the countryside of upstate New York in 1906. The film follows three couples on a weekend in the country. They all end up switching partners, sort of, while learning some lessons about life and love and roads not taken. Alan plays an investment advisor who is having sex problems with his wife. This unhappiness is brought into focus dramatically when an old girlfriend, Mia Farrow, comes to visit with her fiancé. When Alan finds out that she is coming, his mind is obsessed to what might have been between them. And he talks about that with her when they walk alone in the woods. Do you, do you remember these woods at all? Do you remember this, this area? Do you remember the bridge down there? Yeah, oh, yeah, of course yeah? I remember. It was one of the most beautiful summer nights I'd ever seen. I know, it was very romantic. I think about that night all the time. Yeah. Really? Yeah, huh? I do. Yeah. And whenever I think about it, I want to kill you. To kill you or kill myself, but much more you. What for? Do you have any idea how much I lusted after you? Well, why didn't you do something? I wanted you to. You were this diplomat's daughter raised by nuns. You know, I was shy. We were not in love. It was pure animal lust. 
That's just what I was in the mood for. I know, I know. I missed an opportunity. I I've regretted it ever since. You know, that's the saddest thing in life is a missed opportunity. And, and particularly rotten in this case, because after you left, a month after you went to Europe, I learned only then that you were and had been sleeping with everyone. Everyone. Well, not everyone. Uh -huh. Well, maybe it was everyone. Yeah, I wouldn't have been the first. I'd have been the 21st. Writers, bankers, poets, the, the entire infield of the Chicago White Sox. A cute moment, and the best part of this film for me was its advice to seize the moment that life presents. This is not Woody Allen's laugh a minute picture, though. It's more of a mood piece, a rumination on the forces that keep couples apart or draw them together for short periods of time. It's a slight movie, not substantial. Other characters include a pompous professor, a hot to trot doctor, and a willing <laughs> nurse. But I found myself at a distance from these characters. The ending of the movie also was totally arbitrary. Nothing led up to it. A Midsummer Night sex comedy gave me some smiles, made me think about the idea of seizing the moment. But that's all, and frankly, I expect more than that from a movie from Woody Allen. This was a very lightweight film. I was yeah. disappointed by it, too. I was sitting there waiting for people to engage, you know. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is the issue? What do they really care about? Why are they really here? Not that it should have been, you know, up at some hyper level of manic comedy or something, but just that everybody seems so laid back and yeah. they kind of drifted in and out of situations that never really amounted to I anything. I thought it also... Uh, like a meditation on the subject. Well, it also meandered about in terms of its style. Mm -hmm. I mean, he does have some of his throwaway gags in there. Some, mm -hmm. not too many. Uh, it's like he's hedging his bets. Then it's sort of serious and, uh, and, and mystical about, you know, life and whether you should choose uh, things that you feel about or, or regret them or who you should be involved with, long-distance relationships or ones that are right in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, but then jokes. I, I just couldn't get a real... I didn't feel it was very well directed in the sense of written, maybe, in the sense of picked and worked through. Mm -hmm. You know, Woody Allen is one of the very few writer-director stars that we have, just one of a mm -hmm. handful, and he's very talented. Mm -hmm. He's one of my favorite filmmakers, Martin. and it's interesting to watch his progress, but after Annie Hall and Manhattan, he's lost his way, I think. Stardust memories in this film were really disappointments. Okay. Well, let's look now at another film, The World According to Garp, a movie based on John Irving's best-selling novel in which the hero was a genial, likable, simple, and very confused wanderer through many of the worlds of women. Garp is born after his father is dead, and he's raised by an eccentric mother who has her doubts about whether or not men are really necessary. Men other than Garp, of course. She dotes on him. <laughs> Robin Williams stars as Garp, and he's a good choice for this role. He's open-faced, sincere, sweet, and perhaps just a shade too trusting for his own good. That makes him attractive to women, as in this scene at the boarding school where his mother is the resident nurse. I'm not disturbing you running up and down here. Nope. It's distracting, isn't it? Not to me, it's not. What do you weigh? Is that 112 or so? 113. Oh, pleased to meet you. 158. I'm on the way to 147. Sorry about that. Oh. Oh. My name is T.S. Garp. What's T.S. stand for? Terribly sexy. I used to be terribly shy, but I changed. Oh. I'm Helen Home. Oh, home sweet home. Our new wrestling coach is named Home. Oh, what a hard ass. We call him Home Sweat Home. He's my father. I'm his daughter. We're the home team. Oh. Take care. That was Mary Beth Hurt as Garp's future wife, and as Garp's adventures continue on into manhood, his destiny always seems to be linked up with the fates of various strange women and their strange causes, as in this scene, where Garp and his mother walk down a street and Garp rather uncomfortably tries to explain some of the shadier aspects of modern life. We're also out of school. Is that the latest fashion? No, Mom, that's the oldest profession. Paul? Oh, 
How do you know? Oh, just a writer's instinct. I want to talk with one of them. Mom, come on. No, I want to ask her about Mom. something. About what? I want to ask her about luck. Mom. Mom. Do you feel anything? Did you get any physical enjoyment from it? Not when I'm working. Oh, sometimes. Why do you think men like you? Oh, we really got to go. Well, do you like her? She's very nice, Mom. But... What is it about her that you want? I don't mean just her sex parts. I mean, is there something else that satisfies? What's the combination? How do you feel to be wanted in that way? Does it degrade you to have my son want you in that way, or do you think it only degrades him? I don't know. Do you want her? Do you want her like you want Helen? Is it the same kind of want? You really want to have sex with her? Well, do you? Of course I do. All right. Hey, look. It's all right with me if your mother wants to buy me for you, but she can't come along with us. Oh, no, Jesus, no, no, you absolutely oh. not. I will not have her watching us. I am still a Catholic, believe it or not. You want anything funny like that? You I don't intend to family. watch. I've heard quite enough. Thank you so much for your time. You do what you want to do or what you have to do, I guess. Yes. Oh, Don't Mom. give me money here. Why not? Because it's illegal, Mom. Why? Because it is. That was Swoozie Kurtz as the hooker and Garb's <laughs> mother is played by Glenn Close. She becomes a famous feminist author and sort of a secular saint and eccentric. Garb marries, he begins a family, and he endures a series of accidents and adventures in this film. The world, according to Garb, is a curious experience, though, for the viewer, or at least it was for me, because... <laughs> While all of these events are, events are wonderfully well acted, and most of them were pretty interesting at the time, when the movie was over, I didn't have the slightest clue as to what Garp thought about his life or what the movie wanted me to think about it either. I liked the movie, but I didn't know where to go with it. As an experience, sitting there in the theater, I, at each moment I thought, this is nice, this is nice. And at the end I thought, is that all there is? Well, let me give it a try, because I love this movie. Not, I, it grew on me. It mm -hmm. absolutely grew on me. You know, I think one of the keys is the film opens with some marvelous credits of a baby, a little baby smiling and being lifted mm -hmm. in front of the camera, and it closes with those same credits. Mm -hmm. And I think that very much that this film, by George Roy Hill, the director at least, is uh, about the arc of a whole life. We have been talking on this show about characters who are restrained and nervous and shy and not aggressive. Mm -hmm. Garp is full of characters, as the mother was in that scene, of people who are living life about as flat out as mm -hmm. you can get. Mm -hmm. And I think that this film celebrates the joy of being alive, conquering disaster, as Garp has thrown every disaster in his life, and he is resilient. I think this is a movie celebrating what human beings can do. And I got that as I, gradually through the film. I think that you have provided for me right now what I wish the movie had provided okay. for me. And I think you've either put it in or found it there, and I wasn't able to find it. I think that a lot of the eccentric behavior in this film, which is indeed filled with life, is simply sound and motion. It is simply people behaving in this way so that we look at their behavior. Now, this is funny because I'm recommending the movie. I liked it, but I just didn't find, after it was all over, that it added up to anything. Well, sometimes you find the hook and sometimes you don't. I think that this film is one that grows on people. It is m unlike any m picture I've seen, certainly an American movie. And I want to put a plug in for George Roy Hill. I think he's a terrific director. He also handles novels very well. Slaughterhouse Five was another one, and he, this one, Garp, is terrific, too. Oh, oh here he there. is, lumbering into right the balcony. Here. Good old Zeke the Wonder Dog. Right, here to Zeke. help us pick out the dogs of the week. Right the week's here. worst movie. Stay right with me. Now, my dog this week, there he goes, is Garden of the Dead, <laughs> a truly laughable zombie picture in which a bunch of inmates of a California prison become addicted to formaldehyde vapors, and during a prison break, when some of the formaldehyde is spilled on the prison graveyard, <laughs> all of the dead former inmates pop up out of the ground, perfect shape, and begin terrorizing just about anyone who isn't a zombie. The dialogue is all a joke. The formaldehyde sniffing scenes are an even <laughs> bigger laugh. This film has nothing on reefer madness. And the prison is guarded by, get this, fat guards and a thin fence. I think they would have done better if it had been just the other way around. One nice thing about this dog, though, Garden of the Dead is the shortest dog I've ever seen, <laughs> only 58 minutes, and I'd like to thank the producers for that. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> My dog this week is Seed of Terror, a movie that's just now going into release around the country, although... My research indicates that this film was originally entitled Grave of the Vampire, and it was finished in 1974. Now, you might ask,
how did their marketing strategy require that they wait eight years to release this film? If you've seen it, you wouldn't have asked that question. They rushed it in the release. <laughs> Seed of Terror is about an immortal vampire who rapes an innocent young woman on a college campus, and the doctors warn her that her baby isn't human, but she doesn't listen, and she doesn't even think it's peculiar that the little kid turns out to like blood better than milk. She just <laughs> fills up a baby bottle with blood, which little tyke likes just fine. Meanwhile, William Smith stars as a graduate student of folklore whose research reveals that a famous 18th century vampire is alive and living on campus and, in fact, is teaching the folklore course. <laughs> now, I don't think he'd better go to see that professor after class. Now, before we get on to the recap of the movies, mm -hmm. there was an, an unfinished dog business we have. Mm -hmm. That was a, uh, a couple weeks ago. You gave a dog citation to Universal Pictures for not letting you see the movie Barbarossa, which I had seen, I liked, I wanted to review mm -hmm. on this show. You did, too and you just asked for them to see it. What happened? Barbarossa was the picture with Willie Nelson and Gary Busey, right. and it's about a Western legend. I right. got a telephone call after that show from William Whitliffe down in Texas, who wrote the movie, and he also wrote Raggedy Man. Mm -hmm. And he said that they had looked into it, and the Universal had decided that the film was a flop. And so they were taking it out of release. It's on a shelf. And all I have to say to Universal Pictures is, with some of that $125 million that you've already made from E.T., could you send a guy upstairs and get Barbarossa and let me have a look at it? I'd really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Just a look, right? Yeah. Okay. And now let's recap our reactions to the main movies on this show. Both Roger and I agree that Young Doctors in Love is a weak attempt at parody. Just too few laughs, two no votes for that one. However, we both admired Eric Romay's The Aviator's Wife, a brittle French comedy of relationships, two yes votes for that. And we agree that Woody Allen's A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy is mildly amusing, but not much more. And we expect more from Woody Allen. And finally, we both like George Roy Hill's film of John Irving's novel, The World According to Garp with Robin Williams, describing the full arc of a crazy life. Two yes votes for Garp on film. A fine adaptation. That's all for this week. Join us next time when we'll take a look at The Best Little Her House in Texas, a musical comedy starring Dolly Parton and Burt Reynolds, and also Night Shift, a comedy starring Henry Winkler. Until then... We'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.